Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads. We're really glad you're here. Uh, my name is Kirk Higgins, and for those of you who are new to our Close Read format, every other Thursday, we work our way through primary sources from throughout American history, um, looking for different ideas and things that we can unpack and discuss, um, and hopefully uh, help us better understand uh, what's going on in our nation. So um, today we have, um, we're looking at an important Supreme Court decision um, from the 20th century. Uh, it's Bush v. Gore from 2000. Um, and to help me with unpacking this, um, I'm fortunate to be joined by Dr. Josh Dunn. Josh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. So today, like every week with our close reads, we can't go through the entire decision that we're going to be looking at, but we're going to look at a few different excerpts. Um, and one of the things I like to start out with, Josh, is thinking about sort of a big question that can guide our conversation. Um, and this week for me, uh, this case it's it's a complex case. It's one that's discussed um, a lot. It was very controversial at the time, um, but it brings up a lot of questions that I'm seeing today in the news, which is the integrity of the court and how is it that we think about um, our the place of the Supreme Court within our overall political system and our constitutional system. Um, and so I'm just curious from your from your opinion, um, what is it what is it that you think about this case that you know we should think about when it relates to the role of the court and sort of the role of the court within our constitutional system. Yeah, great question. So uh, in some ways, you would have to say that this case is of limited significance, at least for the court itself. Uh, that is the court, and we'll probably talk about this, tried very explicitly tried to limit the reach of this ruling, precisely because it realized what it was doing was so extraordinary. <laughs> but that then points to the fact that it was drawn into this very significant election controversy that, of course, had uh, an effect on the election itself. Um, and again, we'll probably talk about this. It's not that the Supreme Court selected Bush, uh, but it foreclosed any options remaining for Vice President Gore right, in, the, in, in the election. And so that really uh, finished the process, right? So um, it tells you that the court is there. <laughs> it tells you that these contestants in these contested uh, elections are gonna turn to the court when um, there are significant uh, outcomes that are in dispute. And then the question of course is, uh, how how legitimate are the legal claims? And at the core of this case, I think, is the legitimacy of the legal claims and that the reasoning of the court that the, the, the court ended up relying on uh, to resolve the case. Great. Well, with that, let's dive into the case. Great. So, Josh, just to start with, um, thinking about the historical context of this case in particular, and you know, we've got these now this big constitutional question on the table. We're talking about two thousand um, mm -hmm. itself. So. Could you maybe just let us know kind of what was going on in 2000? What was the political atmosphere like from a historical point of view? Um, and then we'll kind of transition that into what actually happened on election night uh, in 2000. Yeah, so the election of 2000, everyone expected it to be very closely and tightly contested going into election night. Uh, I think if you actually look at the circumstances leading up to the election, um, by many measures, it should have been a, a very easy victory for Vice President Gore. Um, you know, political scientists often will look at the, uh, the performance of the economy in the years uh, immediately preceding election as the best predictor of an electoral outcome. And the economy, of course, had done very well in, in, in the 1990s. And so by that measure, it, it should have been, a, again, a fairly easy victory for, for Vice President Gore. However, some of the other controversies and scandals surrounding the Clinton administration, I think, suppressed uh, Vice President Gore's ability to campaign on the on those successes because he had to kind of keep his connection to the, the Clinton administration and some of those scandals at, at arm's length. Uh, so that had the effect of actually tightening the race in a way that, uh, given the just the underlying factors of, of the election, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have ex have have expected. Uh, so very closely contested. Uh, no one knew who's going to go in, going to win going into election night. And um, yeah, and it turned out that election night was really long. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so you have this election. Yeah. Seemingly Vice President Al Gore and um, former governor of Texas, George Bush, are the two candidates that are running. Um, and yeah, it seems I mean, it's just this weird mix, which often happens in American politics. Right. There's it's always sort of a, a mysterious science. You've got these expectations. But then when those expectations get subverted, you know, things really start to, um, I think coming into question is probably too strong, but people 
kind of look really closely at what's going on, and particularly when it's a really close election in only a few states, again, because the electoral system is how we elect um, presidents. Um, you know, when it comes down to those few states, those few states become really important. And in this case, Florida became that important state. Yeah, it came down to one state. <laughs> yeah, came, came, right. came down to one state. Yeah, so election night, it turned out to be very interesting. Uh, uh, it actually looked early in the evening like it was going to be a very bad night for uh, George Bush. The uh, uh, most of the media outlets actually called Florida for uh, for Gore, uh, but they called Florida for Gore uh, prior to some of the uh, more Republican leaning counties in Florida actually turning in their votes, and in particular some of the uh, the counties in the Panhandle, which are actually in the Central Time Zone. They tend to be very red, uh, you know, precincts <laughs> over in that part of, part of Florida. Uh, and so the Bush campaign ended up being very angry about uh, some of the predictions that were that were made, and it could have even had an effect in some of the states out west as well. The the uh, because once it's called for Gore, then you know some people might say, "Well, Florida's gone for Gore. What's the chance? What are the chances that Bush is going to have to actually pull this thing out?" Nevertheless, as the night went on, the of course the 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 uh, media outlets um, pulled back on that prediction and put Florida back into the toss up category. Um, so, uh, and then of course, you know, we were all waiting up until, uh, you know, two, three, four, uh, and then, uh, in the morning and it turned out we were waiting up for several more weeks. <laughs> That's right. And so the election comes down, they, they have, you know, it gets called, but it's on such a close vote mm -hmm. that you then have this sort of complexity that comes with looking at these different Florida laws when it comes to recounts. So recounts get triggered. Um, there's confusion over, um, you know, whether, what, you know, how long these recounts can go for, what the accepted timeline is on the recount. So all of this kind of complexity comes into it. But but what it essentially boils down to is that recounts were called for, and then right. it's how those recounts were supposed to take place. <clears throat> Excuse me. How those recounts were supposed to take place, um, and then by when they needed to have them completed. So you have kind of this timeline, and then the method by which those recounts are happening. Is that is that kind of the, the, exactly. the basic way so of looking at it? So immediately on election night, Bush, uh, the, the final vote on election night actually had Bush up by 1,700 some votes, close to 1,800 votes. Uh, in Florida, you automatically trigger trigger a machine recount uh, with uh, if the race is closer than 0.5%. And that was easily within 0.5%. And so they did a machine recount. After that uh, machine recount, Bush's lead had narrowed to about 325, 327 votes. I forget the pre precise number. So it was much closer. Right? Uh, and then, of course, given that it's that close, uh, you know, of course, the Gore campaign can can taste victory. They can see that the, the, that the, the distance is small enough, uh, close enough that they might be it might be able to make up that gap of, of just a few few hundred votes. And so then that leads to them calling for recounts. Uh, particularly in some uh, some uh, heavily democratic counties, for in, per, uh, in particular four heavily democrat uh, democratic counties, and so then that's what starts the whole kind of legal process going as well, right? They they they're asking for recounts in heavily democratic uh, counties. Then there are the controversies about how they're recounting those ballots in those counties. You end up with lots of legal proceedings working through the um, federal courts and and the state courts. Right. So that's the final piece of this. Right. So we have all these recounts. The legitimacy of the recounts is questioned. The Florida Supreme Court's involved. Um, they come down with a ruling. Um, but eventually there's such controversy over what constitutes a legitimate recount, when it needs to be completed and how it is. We're actually going to get to a decision that there there comes a point that an arbiter needs to seemingly be a part of that. And that is kind of the role the Supreme Court plays in this. Right. They they earlier on, I think you mentioned, I think it's really significant that the court didn't seek out inter, like interjecting itself into this right. case. Um, but instead, it, it kind of like fell to the Supreme Court because there needed to be a, a, a body that made a decision. Um, and the path to the court was the legal one, which or that, I guess, through the law mm -hmm. um, that seemed to make the most sense. Right, right. So yes, the Supreme Court ended up being the backstop. <laughs> that was the, 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 the final place that you could go in this process. Of course, the role of the Florida Supreme Court, I think is in some ways just as crucial as the US Supreme Court. Because of the, some of the decisions they made, it actually 
it, it made it inevitable that the U.S. Supreme Court was going to get involved. It actually pushed it uh, onto the onto the Supreme Court's agenda, and there was so there was no way that they could uh, avoid it. Um, and so again, you have this this legal battle over uh, certifying the election. Uh, the Florida Secretary of State wants to certify the election. Gore's challenging this. Uh, Gore then asks for a full recount, but there had been an entire entire trial process as well. The Gore campaign essentially lost uh, at trial. Uh, it went to the that ends up going to the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Supreme Court ends up overturning these lower court decisions, requiring a full recount uh, of all the undervotes, manual recounts of of all of the undervotes. Interestingly, as well, they overturned, and this is something that uh, is often not mentioned as well, uh, but the Florida Supreme Court ended up overturning the trial court on some factual questions, some important factual questions. And if you don't know, know anything about the role of appellate courts, that's not their job, right? Um, is to, they aren't supposed to be making judgments about factual questions because they, they didn't see all the evidence. Their job is to decide whether or not the law was properly applied. So that complicated the situation as well. Also, I think, forcing the, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court's hand uh, and uh, or at least encouraging a, a certain segment of the U.S. Supreme Court to want to get involved. Yeah, and not to mention that all this is happening over the course of just a couple of weeks. So there's a lot right. of back and forth, a lot of paperwork, yes. a lot yeah. of arguments that are all taking place. Um, and I should mention, too, if anyone's looking for a good quick overview of this, um, the Bill of Rights Institute is releasing uh, one of our homework help videos on this course that lays out um, some of this timeline. Because, again, I mean, I think it, I, this is such a complex situation that seemingly gets more complex. And that's kind of the democratic <laughs> way sometimes, right? right. It's, we're, we're just trying to get to a place where we understand um, what people are voting for um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's recognized um, and we have all this complicated process for, for getting to that place, which um, brings me, I think, to the first thing I want to take a look at here, which is part of the argument that was included that the, the Bush legal team brought forward about these recounts um, is about equal protection, right? So um, we're all looking for a free and fair election, or at least that's that's what the stated goal of a democratic election is. It has to be trusted, it has to be relied on. Um, and part of that came down to in the legal team for the Bush uh, Bush's side um, that that the votes have to be counted equally. So there needs to be some kind of uh, equal um, uh, measure for what counts as a vote and what doesn't count as a vote. So Josh, could you maybe just mention something about what the Equal Protection Clause is and then how it was applied in this case? Right, so you have the Equal Protection Clause, part of the 14th Amendment. There are three primary substantive components of the, of the, the 14th Amendment. It guarantees uh, privileges or immunities. That clause has largely been written out of the Constitution by, by the Supreme Court. So we're left with equal protection and due, due process of law. Uh, due process clause ends up becoming uh, crucial for incorporating the Bill of Rights to apply to the states. Equal protection, though, becomes quite important in many areas of civil liberties. Of course, Brown versus Board of Education, desegregation, racial discrimination. That's where you see a significant effect of the uh, in use of the equal protection clause. Uh, but it also becomes uh, very significant when the Supreme Court starts actually getting involved in elections. Uh, and in, in a, quite importantly, with reapportionment and redistricting. So you go back to 1962, very important case, Baker versus Carr. It's in that case, the Supreme Court says that reapportionment is not a political question. Uh, and that what that means is that it's actually justiciable. So the court can actually rule on this. Previously, they had always ruled that redistricting itself was uh, left to the legislature. That is, the Constitution had committed it to state legislatures, and so they had the authority to, re, uh, to, to redistrict uh, and re reapportion seats as they saw fit. And the argument was that in many states, you had houses in state legislatures that were grossly malapportioned. Uh, and so, uh, for instance, Tennessee was the where Baker versus Carr um, originated, they really had not reapportioned and redistricted their seats since I think 1900. Uh, and so you had seen a significant shift in the population moving from rural areas to urban areas. And so people living in rural areas had disproportionate, their votes uh, had a disproportionate power in that system. Then you move to 1964 and you get uh, Reynolds versus Sims. 
Chief Justice Earl Warren are, has said that Reynolds versus Sims was the most important decision uh, during his tenure as Chief Justice. So that tells you something, given the important decisions that were handed down. But that was an application of the Equal Protection Clause to the redistricting process, reapportionment process, where they said that state legislative houses had to be apportioned according to the principle of one person, one vote. Uh, now, again, this was novel. Uh, historically, this was not, had not been the case. And people had, did not think that it was the role of the court to apply the Equal Protection Clause in that way. But that's when you do see the Supreme Court start using the Equal Protection Clause as the basis for evaluating election procedures. <laughs> um, and I, in some ways, you could say that it be, ends up becoming the foundation for Bush versus Gore itself. I, I don't think that you get Bush, for, Bush versus Gore and the Equal Protection arguments absent that initial uh, use of the Equal Protection Clause by the Warren Court back in the 1960s. Yeah, so that's really interesting because it, it shows you know, again, the, the court finds itself in the situation, but it has been, you know, ruling on these kinds of election things. I think, again, the exception here is it's it's ruling, it's making what amounts to a an election deciding decision. And of course, yeah. here when they're looking at that equal protection, what they what they begin to to talk about is, well, you you need this equal rule for a val like everybody's vote needs to count, right? One person, right. one vote. If you voted, it needs to count. And so you had this is where the famous hanging chads come in, right? Yes. Is that well, how do you in, how do you determine voter intent if it's not clear? And if you right. in, in the idea is there needs to be a remedy for that, um, but the Supreme Court essentially comes down, and we'll talk about this in a second, but says yeah. there, there's not enough time for this to be fairly adjudicated, um, where every vote is going to count, um, and and still fall under this equal protection, or at least that was my reading. Yes. Is that is that pretty close? That, yeah, that, that yeah. that's correct. That the way that the Florida Supreme Court had mandated the recount was a violation of the equal protection clause. Uh, and again, we'll probably say more about this, but the Florida Supreme Court said they needed to recount the ballots, the undervote, the, and those are ballots where uh, the machine had not recognized someone voting for president. And they said they said that the intent of the voter should be the standard. And that ends up being crucial for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and the majority in, uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court thought that that actually wasn't a standard at all. Uh, and therefore, that's what ends up triggering the Equal Protection Clause, uh, because you could have wide variation uh, across not not just with uh, across jurisdictions, but even within jurisdictions. Right. We even within single counties, you could have a recounting of ballots where um, one dimple on a chad might to, to one, you know, one group of recounters might say that shows that they were trying to vote for one particular person, but and then across the county, someone else might say it, it, it's not. Yeah. Democracy is not always the most efficient form of government. I think that's, uh, yes. that's safe yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, and so to make this even more complicated, you know, so the court finally brings down its ruling um, and it ends up sort of giving two rulings. Um, it gives a per curiam decision, um, which is about uh, about the, the recount violates the Equal Protection Clause. So that is it saying, look, this doesn't, this, this violates the Equal Protection Clause. And then the second ruling, as I understand it, is about the remedy or what's to be done because of this mm -hmm. violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, so, but let's focus on this per curiam decision first. Um, and here we have a portion of it. So first, I guess, what is a per curiam decision? Um, and then um, we can get into just analyzing a little bit of the, the, the language that's here. Okay, so uh, officially a per curiam de a decision is that it's a decision for the court, but it's an unsigned one. And typically what you see with per curiam decisions is where they agree on the outcome, uh, and, but often they will disagree about the reasons <laughs> for, for the arriving at that, at that particular outcome. Uh, but uh, Sometimes it can just be because they just want to speak in a, a in a single voice rather than indicating that one person was the, the the author of the decision and that other other justices signed on. Yeah, so kind of this idea that as we were talking about before, when we're talking about something as simple as voter intent matters, when the Florida Supreme Court hands that down, those fine points of law are really important, and so the procurium decision sort of covers for that, right? It's just giving out one but leaving room. I guess for disagreement, but just getting to a place where it's. I guess, yes. So they agree easy, that you know on some court they agree on some core issues that and and so they're going to announce this. And I think partly also just the political circumstances surrounding this. 
uh, it probably made sense for those who agreed with the, the reasoning, particularly on the equal protection reasoning, to, to, to issue a per curiam uh, decision rather than, again, identifying one justice as the, as the, the author for the opinion and the others, uh, others joining it. So rather, you could just say, this is the opinion for the court. Um, it probably is, uh, I, I, or you, it's reasonable to think that they thought that that would um, uh, look to the public um, less political, right? That it's just, this is the court's opinion. Right, right. Yeah, and so here we're getting to that big question again of what, how does this weigh on sort of the integrity of the court itself. And right. here, the, the way that I read this first portion of the, and again, these are just um, segments. This is not the entire ruling. So I encourage you, um, we have the link here in our PowerPoint um, and we'll be able to link it um, in other places too to read the entire opinion. But um, but they sort of point to this too. They're talking about the closest an election. And it already seems here that the court is saying, look, you know, this is, this is really close and it's problematic um, when you have 2% <laughs> Of ballots cast not registering a vote for president for whatever reason, right? And and when it comes down to that fine of a margin, it seems here the court is throwing out sort of a cautionary look. This is really close. We don't necessarily want to be weighing in, but we're almost our hands being forced to, because some, there has to be some kind of uh, standard applied to how it is that we're understanding what what you know essentially where consent lies. What what, what are we consenting to? Right. Yes, so uh, this ends up being crucial for the court. Um, uh, that's uh, obviously the election is uh, extremely important. And so these very fine grained distinctions about how you're gonna decide uh, whether or not someone actually intended to vote for someone else, uh, in, they end up being very important. Um, and that obviously that obviously weighs on the five justices who who ended up voting to to, to uh, forbid a recount, a full recount. Yeah, and here you know, in a little bit more of the per curiam decision, you see this what you called out earlier, Josh, the, the intent of the voter. Um, and you know, I, I love this kind of line. It's this is this is this is unobjectionable as an abstract proposition and a starting principle. The problem, in, the problem in here is in the absence of specific standards to ensure its equal application. The formulation of uniform rules to determine intent based on these reoccurring circumstances is practicable and we conclude necessary. Um, so to kind of put these in words that I can comprehend because sometimes the Supreme Court writes above my head. Um, but the way I read this is, look, it's possible to figure out clearly how people voted and we can figure out a, a standard for applying that equally and because we can do that, or because the, the state of Florida can do that, um, they should do that in order to come to a decision. So essentially, the way that I read this is equal protection can happen if we figure out a way to apply it, which seems reasonable. And so mm -hmm. therefore, we need to apply equal protection in this case. Right. So another way of rephrasing that part about the intent of the voter, what the court was really saying, the intent of the voter isn't a standard. It's not a standard. It's the question, right? right? What was the intent of the voter? And so the, when the Florida Supreme Court said you have to recount the ballots and use the intent of the voter as the standard, they weren't really providing any guidance at all. And so the majority for the Supreme Court was arguing that if you're going to uh, require this recount, you actually have to establish uh, clearer standards so that you won't get this variation across jurisdictions or within jurisdictions for how much of an indentation on a Chad might actually count. And so, yes, the court seemed to think that they could have, that it would have been possible uh, to come up with a standard for recounting the ballots uh, that would have been in compliance with the Equal Protection Clause, but it was too late. <laughs> uh, and it, so there's no way that they could have done it in the Florida Supreme Court if they want, if they had wanted them to recount the ballots in accordance with the Equal Protection Clause, should have done better than just stating the intent of the voter. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of like that. Like, yes, you've just restated the question. Like, we understand that what the intent of the voter is is um, that that's interesting. And I think timing is important to point out here too, because there are, I mean, transition of power, transitions of power have to happen on a timeline. You have mm -hmm. to have a date when it occurs. Otherwise, you get delays, things get complicated. And so that's really the, the pressure that I think is is weighing upon this decision, which 
ultimately makes things really challenging, which is there's a deadline. We've got to shift the government from, you know, if it's going to be a, a handover of power, I mean, it would be regardless because a new administration is coming in, but whether or not it's transferring to a candidate of another party or the same party, it doesn't matter. We've got to get to a resolution on this within a timely manner in order for the government to function, essentially. Yes. And Florida, yeah, federal law said that there was a safe harbor for Florida actually having finalized the outcome of its election, and that was December 12th. And the Supreme Court handed out handed down its decision on December 12th. I, I, I think actually after the the the, the time uh, on December 12th that it had to be uh, had to be completed by, and then the Electoral College was going to vote on December 18th. Uh, and so that was of course weighing on the Supreme Court uh, as well, which which was if Florida can't complete the recounts uh, in time uh, to actually legally certify, um, satisfactorily certify its outcome, uh, then what happens to Florida's electors? Uh, does Florida actually get to participate in the Electoral College? The Florida legislature had actually held hearings about uh, what to do under those circumstances, and they were actually considering simply sending their own electors. If for some reason the process wouldn't have concluded in time, they were gonna vote to send their, their uh, chosen slate of electors to the Electoral College. That was, on, that was actually on the table for them. Uh, and the outcome would have been the same because the Republicans control both houses of the uh, Florida legislature. So they of course would have sent Republican electors to the Electoral right. College. Right, man. That would have been that would have certainly been a, another interesting sort of chapter in this whole. Oh yes, thing, yes, yeah. Um, and so uh, this is the final piece of the per curiam decision. Then we'll go on and look at the the minority decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I thought this was really significant because again, here's the court sort of having its own uh, self reflective moment where it says none are more conscious of the vital limits on judicial authority um, than are the members of this court, and none stand more in admiration of the Constitution's design to lead the selection of the president to the people through their legislatures and to this political sphere. Um, to me, this gets right at the heart of this really core question that's happening here. So we have this stuff about the equal protection. We have how it is we're gonna get, you know, how, how it is we're gonna address that. But fundamentally at the core of this is a question about what, what constitutes a free and fair election, meaning people have access to vote um, and, you know, it's recognized that that vote is legitimate. And, how is the court weighing in? So the court being, you know, this, the third branch, it's apart from the political system, very deliberately so in the design of the founders that it's not intended to have a political voice because it's supposed to be a neutral arbiter on the law. And this is the court recognizing that and recognizing that it's now in a tricky situation because the law is what's determining the validity of the elections. And so it's this sort of complicated cross um, pollination but I think it's, I mean, the court is very, trying to be very clear here in saying, look, we recognize this could be seen as us overstepping. Um, we didn't seek this out essentially, but we are ruling on this because it's our responsibility. Um, as I say, our unsought responsibility to resolve the federal and constitutional issues within the judicial system has been forced to confront. So they're being forced to confront these here. Right, so again, I think the court recognized uh, that this was an astonishing exercise of power historically uh, to intervene in an, uh, an election this way. And it does it clearly did not want this to become uh, a precedent that the court would be called upon to resolve elections regularly <laughs> in this way. And so that's why in the decision itself, they said that they were limiting, that this analysis was limited to this particular set of facts only. Uh, and, uh, so what they were really saying was, this has no presidential value. Right? We are just, we, we don't wanna get involved. We feel like we have to get involved, but we're trying to preclude people from relying on this in the future. Uh, so you could view Bush versus Gore as like a one-way ticket for one day only. <laughs> that was it. That's what they were trying to say. Now. It turns out that lower courts have at least cited Bush versus Gore hundreds of times. Uh, it's unclear how much effect those, uh, those citations have actually had, how much it's actually shaped the, the reasoning, but the court clearly was trying to, to, uh, to limit the, the, the long-term effects of this decision, uh, partly because of those legitimacy questions uh, that they didn't want to become seen as the arbiter of, you know, well, certainly presidential elections, but uh, really elections as a whole. 
Yeah, because yeah, I mean, it, it's a tricky position for them to be in because I think one of the things that's that's interesting to me is at least that the court the court has enough legitimacy legitimacy to make this ruling and for people to adhere to it, mm -hmm. right? So um, the Gore campaign doesn't continue to try and litigate the decision after I mean maybe immediately after, but not not for years and years and years afterwards trying to undermine the right, legitimacy right. of the next president. We still have the transfer of power. Which, you know, in my opinion, at least has something to say about the how the court is seen as a legitimate arbiter, um, a non-political arbiter in a lot of senses. Oh yes, uh, within minutes of the court announcing this decision, uh, Vice President Gore conceded. Right. Um, right. It, it, you know, said said that he wasn't going to challenge it anymore. Right. The Supreme Court has spoken. That's the kind of authority that the Supreme Court uh, had. Uh, and there are some who argue that that's that's the best justification for the decision itself. That if this process had continued, we would have been mired in even deeper political controversy. Uh, the outcome probably would have been the same, but the the questions of of legitimacy would have been even worse. Uh, so, for instance, Richard Posner, the famous lower court judge, appellate court judge, that's essentially his treatment of this uh, of this case. The Supreme Court's reasoning is it's not terribly persuaded by, by it. Um, but they were trying to fix a problem that had been created by lower courts. Uh, they didn't really have any other alternative that wouldn't have been actually worse uh, for, for the country. Um, and that if the recount had actually proceeded, Bush still would have won. It's just they would have taken longer than questions of the Electoral College vote. All of that would have been hovering uh, uh, over everything. Um, in fact, there was a consortium of news organizations that went and recounted every ballot uh, after the election. And by every conceivable method of recounting the ballots, uh, Bush still would have won. Uh, there was one method that was not on the table that no one was considering where Gore would have uh, possibly eked out a, a, eked out a victory. Um, but yeah, it just would have, the, this process would have just carried on you know, much longer. Yeah. Well, so the court makes its procurium decision and it rules about the Equal Protection Clause. And then there's this another ruling about sort of the remedy. So now what happens because of this violation of the Equal Protection right. Clause? Um, and that decision, so the procurium was seven to two, the remedy was five to four. Mm -hmm. um, and here we have two different uh, sort of excerpts from uh, minority opinions. Um, one from uh, this first one here from from Justice Stephen Breyer, um, who who is, who uh, is, is, Pretty, it seems frustrated um, about halting the recount, um, right. and it seems to be that, you know, that that he is concerned about sort of the fairness of how this is happening, and mm -hmm. um, that he he seems as though he thinks, look, you can have this done in an equal amount of time, but we're not even making an attempt to do it. Is how I kind of read this. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, he signed on to the majority opinion, which is interesting because it, in some ways. The, the ideological factions on the court flipped in, in Bush versus Gore. Uh, historically, the more liberal block of justices were much more sympathetic to, shall we say, expansive and flexible interpretations of the Equal Protection Clause, uh, where conservatives had been more suspicious of it. Uh, and so I think Justice Breyer, part of the reason he signs on with a majority opinion is because he does agree that the Equal Protection Clause should be applied in, in these kinds of broad ways. Uh, but he then, of course, disagreed with the outcome uh, or the remedy, which was to, to halt, halt the recount. Uh, he thought it should have been sent back to, the, to Florida so that they could try to develop a, a standard, an actual standard that could have satisfied what he would have regarded as uh, 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 the Equal Protection Clause uh, principles. Yeah, and so then we also have Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who um, also dissents here again in the remedy. So mm -hmm. um, Breyer was saying, "Look, send it back to the state. Um, they, they need to they need to come up with a remedy if that's what we're saying needs to happen." Um, and here Ginsburg seems to be poking a little bit at the at the timing question, mm -hmm. um, and you know, um, trying to get at again a remedy that can seemingly turn it back over to the electorate and keep at least as my reading, try to keep the court even further away from any kind of political question. Am I, am I following that about right? Yeah. So I, um, I mean, obviously she wanted the, the a recount to proceed, send it, you know, let them uh, go and, and deal with it. I think some of the question is that 
uh, if you're doing a manual recount of every single uh, of every single undervote uh, in the election, you're gonna have pitched warfare over over each ballot. <laughs> so it's gonna be very right. close. And so the majority clearly thought, well, that when they're going through each ballot that way, uh, there's no. It, it's going to be impossible for them to to finish this uh, in a timely way. Uh, Ginsburg is trying to allay some of those fears uh, and say, well, yes, they can uh, do this, and in in pointing to some of the legal controversies that could arise, showing well, the Florida Supreme Court itself is has been able to resolve uh, or issue uh, substantial legal opinions. Uh, you know, within a day, 29 hours of, 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 of oral argument. So this could be actually done in a more expeditious way than the majority seems to think. Yeah, I, I, I think her, her, her final line here, I mean, sometimes the Supreme Court justices almost sound a little flippant or sarcastic, but I, I like that, she, you know, such an untested prophecy should not decide the presence of the United States saying, look, we don't know if this is going to work or not, but just saying that, you know, saying it's not right. going to work shouldn't shouldn't be the final decision. So, um, well, thank you, Josh. I think um, just kind of in concluding, thinking about so what 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 is this going to be something? You know, we had this ruling in Bush v. Gore. Um, obviously, you know, questions around the uh, whether or not the court is becoming politicized are, are always in the news. It seems that they've been more in the news as of late. Um, I guess where does this case should this case reside in in our um in our thinking about american history and kind of what, what do we think is going to happen with the court moving forward from here is this setting up a pattern that may happen again or are we working to try to avoid this in the future well i think it, it all depends on how close future elections are <laughs> that's that's what it's going to come down to i i my sense is that bush versus gore is going to be of of limited uh impacts in the long run uh because again the court obviously doesn't want to be doing this uh on a regular basis uh as well i think that after bush versus gore many states went and reworked their uh, electoral processes uh to try and avoid <laughs> some of these some of these uh, some of these controversies uh, so hopefully in the future, even in very tightly contested, closely contested races in different states, uh, it's not going to rise to the level because we have recount procedures that are clear, standards for recounts and determining the intent of the vote uh, that are clear ahead of time. Uh, and so I think part of what this is, you could say that the, the long term result of Bush versus Gore is that it sent a signal to state legislatures, you know, clean up your uh, your election law. <laughs> so that's probably, uh, that's going to be the long-term influence of it. Again, I think that overall, uh, the court, because it, no, no side on the court actually wants to, to be in this position, right? Uh, I, I, conservative block on the court, liberal block on the court, neither of them really wanted this or want to be in that, in, in that position. So they're going to do everything they can to, to, to limit the effect and reach of this. Great. Well, thank you, Josh, for joining me and thank all of you for, for tuning in and following along. Again, we're releasing a homework help video on this. Um, what is it? Is a complex case, but asks some really big and important questions um, about sort of the nature of our constitutional system. So um, keep an eye out for that. Make sure to like um, this video if you enjoyed it uh, and subscribe so you can get notified when that homework help uh, video comes out and when all of our content comes out. We release all kinds of content um, on this channel, mostly focusing on um, primary sources and, and conversations. Um, and speaking of which, uh, please reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook um, if you want to be in touch or if you have ideas for content that you want us to cover. Um, I believe our next close read will be on the another Supreme Court case of Wisconsin v. Yoder, which should be great. So um, thank you all again, and we'll see you next time.